My name is Stephanie Schmidt. I'm a graduate student at the University of Illinois, and today I will be presenting about predation risk at Marshford Ness as a result of wetland management at Emmaquan Preserve, a moist soil managed site in central Illinois. I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as a birding club, you may be familiar with what marsh birds are, uh, but we'll go over them, of course. And marsh birds are a group of wetland dependent water birds that include bitterns, rails, herons, and greaves. These birds are often very secretive in nature and cryptically colored, and they reside in dense emergent vegetation such as cattail and bulrush and rarely vocalize. All of this has contributed to these birds being relatively understudied and undersurveyed. Unfortunately, marsh birds are also experiencing widespread population level declines, so there exists a need to identify the sources of these declines and manage for them. So one identified source of marsh bird declines is wetland habitat loss and degradation. So as you can see from this map of Illinois, Illinois is a heavily disturbed landscape. Around 90% of hydric soils in the state of Illinois were drained by the 1980s, and the majority of that drainage occurred in the northern two-thirds of the state for agricultural expansion and urbanization. This circled area over our map is right over our study site, and in that region you can see they've lost around 90 to 99% of their historic wetland acreage. If we take a look at a land use map of the Midwest and focus on Illinois, you can see that the majority of Illinois is red and brown. The red in the northeast corner stands for uh, urban expansion, which is right around the Chicagoland area. And then the rest of the northern two thirds is brown and that stands for cultivated cropland. That circled region again is right over our study site. And if you can look in there really close, you see there's a very thin strip of blue. And those are the emergent wetlands that are surrounding the Illinois River but surrounding those emergent wetlands is again cultivated cropland. So you're gonna hear me say this a lot, Illinois is a heavily disturbed landscape. Another reason for marsh bird declines is predation. Predation accounts for around 70% of reproductive losses in all bird species. So it's important for us to study here with our vulnerable marsh bird species because reproductive losses have long-term population level effects. Consequently, studies have also found that habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation are leading to increases in predation risk. So it appears to us here that these habitat level effects may be the root cause of marsh bird declines and causing other effects to kind of spiral out of control. Um, also, research has found that proper management of existing wetlands, so managing for this root cause, this habitat level cause, may be the solution for managing for marsh bird losses. So one of these management solutions is moist soil management. Moist soil management is a floodplain wetland management technique that is used to slow wetland loss and restore and manage manipulated wetlands. It's used in altered landscapes throughout the United States, so it makes sense for it to be used in Illinois along the Illinois River. One aspect of moist soil management is water level manipulation. So these water level manipulations are used to mimic natural drawdowns of water that would occur in floodplain wetlands from pulses from the river. And they are used to reset wetland plant succession so it stops a wetland from becoming a lake and to create diverse habitat. These drawdowns um, implemented for moist soil manage management operate cyclically and they can either be minimal, moderate or intense. So how it works is it pulls water off of the landscape from the spring through the summer and exposes mudflat during that time. That exposed mudflat is beneficial for moist soil plants that are able to grow under these conditions. And these plants will eventually produce energy rich seeds that feed migrating waterfowl in the fall. These mudflats are also beneficial for shorebirds that are able to forage for aquatic invertebrates um, on the mudflat. And it's beneficial for fur bearers that are typically deterred by deeper water. So when water is pushed off of the landscape, these fur bearers can access the marsh interior and resources that they weren't able to access before. So we know this management technique is benefiting a variety of wetland species, but again, we're concerned with how it may be impacting these vulnerable marsh bird species. So most marsh birds initiate nesting between April and May, but these water drawdowns aren't starting until mid-June. By mid-June, our birds have selected their nest sites for their access to resources, their limited competition, and their protection from predators, and they've made reproductive investments by laying eggs in these nests. The problem with water drawdowns happening in mid-June is that water drawdowns have the ability to change the habitat around the nest. And we think that these drawdowns are actually increasing predation risk. So this solution to manage for habitat that was supposed to decrease predation risk 
might be working in reverse and actually increasing predation risk at nest. So how it can affect habitat um, is that water level manipulations can affect vegetation structure. So marsh birds want to nest in sites that offer the most concealment uh, because this means greater protection from predators and less visibility. But if vegetation structure is changing, then marsh birds may be stuck nesting in sites that offer less concealment and put them at greater risk of predation. These water level manipulations can also change water depth around a nest. So marsh birds want to nest over water because it provides access to food resources like fish or amphibians, and it offers protection from terrestrial predators or those fur bearers that we had mentioned before that are typically deterred by deeper water. But what we're seeing is that as water is pulled off of the landscape and mudflat is exposed, the water's edge is moving closer to the nest and the water below the nest is becoming more shallow and there is increased access to the nest by terrestrial predators. So herein lies our research question. Are water drawdowns increasing predation risk at marsh bird nests? The objective of this study was to determine the spatial and temporal variables that may be influencing predator access at marsh bird nests when predator identity is acknowledged. So our spatial variables can be thought of as habitat variables. And for that, we, met, we measured water depth, nest height, vegetation height, and distance from the water's edge. And our temporal variables can be thought of as activity around the nest. So for that, we measured nest stage, clutch size, and day of year. And as I said before, our study was done at Emaquan Preserve. As you can see from this map, Emaquan Preserve sits to the west of the Illinois River in central Illinois. It consists of Thompson and Flag Lake and the surrounding emergent vegetation. And the entire complex is surrounded by a levee that separates the river from the floodplain wetland. From 1922 to 1993, the site was tiled, ditched, and drained and used for agriculture. In 2000, it was purchased by the Nature Conservancy. And in 2007, restoration at the site began. Today, Emaquan Preserve manages a partial connection to the Illinois River and it uses a pump within the levee to seasonally manipulate water levels at the preserve. In 2020, we observed marsh bird nests at Emaquan Preserve from around mid-May through mid-August. And during that time, the preserve implemented what we would categorize as an intense drawdown and pulled around four and a half feet of water off of the landscape. This is previously an agricultural landscape, so it's relatively flat. And four and a half feet of vertical water exposes a lot of horizontal mud flat throughout the summer. We also wanted to focus our study only on a select few marsh birds we wanted to do that to narrow our search image and also focus on some of the more vulnerable species. The first species we were interested in was the least bittern. Least bittern is a small cryptic heron species. It's associated with dense emergent vegetation and it builds small plate-like nests that are elevated on reed bed edges and over water. These birds are also threatened in Illinois. Our second study species was the American coot. This is a common native diving rail species and it lays large clutches of eggs in floating platform nests that are anchored to vegetation edges and over relatively deep water because they're a diving bird. Our third study species was the common gallinule. This bird is behaviorally and morphologically very similar to the coot, but it's far less common and it's endangered in Illinois. This bird can also build both floating platform nests like the coot and elevated nests like the least bittern. And our fourth and final study species was the black crown night heron. This bird is a colonial heron species that nests in rookeries, either in trees or in dense cattail vegetation. And like the common gallinule, it is endangered in Illinois. So in order to locate the nests of our study species, we surveyed 81 plots at Emaquan Preserve that were defined as dense emergent vegetation or hemi marsh conditions, meaning they're around 50-50 water vegetation. We also surveyed for incidental nests between our plots in areas that had optimal vegetation conditions and increased marsh bird activity. For each nest that we found, we marked the nest and revisited every one to four days to document fate. And at each nest revisit, we collected those spatial and temporal variables that we had discussed before. We also set up nest cameras at a subset of our nests, and they were set up there to continuously record activity at the nest and capture predation events. Past studies have found that using tracks around a nest or marks on an egg are relatively unreliable for identifying predators, so this helped us to alleviate some of that uncertainty. We also wanted to make sure that our cameras didn't have any appreciable effect on nest success. So we concealed these small cameras using paint and vegetation. And we anchored this large floating box, which contains most of our recording equipment and our large car batteries 
um, about two meters away from the nest and flagged around that. So we didn't make it look conspicuous at all around the nest. And we tested the effects of the camera using a logistic regression. Uh, the logistic regression told us that the cameras did not have any significant effect on nest survival for three out of our four species. We weren't able to test the survival on the American coot because we only had one active coot nest throughout the year. Uh, but having no effect on survival for the cameras was really good news for us moving forward and for using this data. Next, we wanted to look at the effects of these habitat manipulations on survival at the nest. And in order to do so, we needed to take our predation events and split them into separate classes. The classes that we had chosen were mammal, reptile, and other. In our mammal category, we observed raccoons and minks. And in our reptile category, we observed fox snakes. All three of these are common generalist wetland edge predators. And in our other category, the majority of our losses were abandonments. So we split our predation events into predator classes instead of using predation as a whole, because predators are differentially affected by different changes on habitat manipulations or activity. And studies have found that using predator specific predation and habitat manipulation data together is far more informative for management decisions than using predation as a whole. So first we looked at mammals and for mammals, we found that water depth was a significant variable affecting mammalian predation. So in our graph here, if you look at the Y axis, that is a daily survival rate. Uh, and what's important about that is we essentially look at how close the value is to one or to zero. So we're looking at the slope there and values closer to one mean it's more likely to survive and closer to zero mean it's more likely to be predated. And on our X axis here, we have our variable of interest. So what this graph is telling me is that nests that are in deeper water are more likely to survive, whereas nests in more shallow water are more likely to be predated by mammals. We also found that distance to the water's edge was significant for mammalian predation. Again, seeing here that nests that are further from the water's edge are more likely to survive, and nests that are closer to the water's edge are more likely to be predated. So in our mammal category, I'd said we had seen minks and raccoons, and both of these are generalist edge predators. So what we're seeing is that early in the season when water levels are high, our mammals are preying on nests that are occupying the same edge habitat that they are using. But later in the season when water is pulled off of the landscape, this usable edge habitat for our mammals is shifting to the marsh interior. And we're seeing that these mammals are preying on more nests that are using the habitat that they are overlapping with. This is supported by past research which has found that raccoons will concentrate their activity on habitat edges and selectively hunt in wetlands, and that deeper water can act as a barrier to the terrestrial predators. So we believe that the mammalian predation that we are seeing is a result of habitat overlap between nesting birds and mammal predators. And as water is pulled off of the landscape for this uh, management technique, this usable habitat is shifting to the marsh interior and overlapping with more nests over time. So this is telling us that these water management uh, techniques are increasing predation risk by mammals. We also found for mammals that clutch size was significant, seeing here that larger clutches were more likely to be predated than smaller clutches. We believe this comes down to detectability. So larger clutches with more eggs or more chicks, they give off more visual or olfactory cues, and they're more detectable by predators. And if predators are able to access nests in the marsh interior, uh, with greater access and greater detectability, you can almost ensure that nest is going to be predated. Next, we looked at reptiles. And for reptiles, we found that day of year was a significant variable, seeing here that nests earlier in the year were more likely to be predated than nests later in the year. We believe this is actually a site-specific response to the drawdowns at Emiquan and may not be broadly applicable. So in our reptile category, all of our reptiles were fox snakes. And we know that fox snakes um, are generalist edge predators and they're capable swimmers, but their movement is typically limited by vegetation cover. They rely on this dense vegetation cover to provide protection from their own predators, which are typically aerial predators or larger birds. So early in the season when water levels are high, we're seeing that fox snakes are going to be preying on nests that are occupying the same vegetated edge habitat that they are using. However, later in the season, when water is pulled off of the landscape and this unvegetated mudflat is exposed, that area proves to be highly risky for our fox snakes. And we don't believe that they are moving to the marsh interior because of the increased risk um, from that mudflat and also because they're generalist predators. They can find another food source. We also found for reptiles, again, that clutch size was significant. 
seeing here that larger clutches are more likely to be predated than smaller clutches. Um, we believe this comes down to detectability and with greater access to nests uh, using the same habitat that they're in, uh, nests that are in the vegetated edge habitat, the ones with larger clutches are more likely to be predated than the smaller clutches. So what we can conclude from the study is that water drawdowns are associated with an increase in mammalian predation. These water drawdowns are pulling water out from under our nests and moving the water's edge closer to the nest. And that's increasing um, overlap between, or it's increasing access to the nest by our mammal predators. We don't believe, however, that these water drawdowns are resulting in an increase in reptile predation. In 2021, we plan to continue this study, but we will also be looking at drawdown intensity, parental movement around the nest, vegetation density, and juvenile survival after leaving the nest. Uh, before I wrap up here, I do wanna say thank you to everybody who has helped my project, especially my technicians, Nora Hargett, Cheyenne Stevens, and the staff at the Forbes Biological Station, and of course, the Nature Conservancy for allowing us to use Emicron Preserve. And then everybody who has helped to fund this project uh, and the DuPage Birding Club for of course allowing me to talk today. And I want to open it up to any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Stephanie. Yes. I love the graphics, I love the pictures, and I love the information. So I, I wish you guys luck in your study next year and um, influencing policy going forward, which is you know one of those land management things that's always great. And you can learn this yeah. stuff and then try to apply it to the real lives of these animals. That's great. Anyone have a question they want to type in or ask? It's a lot to take in. This will be is, is being recorded and put on YouTube, so you can check out the various facets of this study, <laughs> which I think we just got in a nutshell, actually. Um, but you can check it out there. Let's see. Oh, what is the title of your study? Uh, I wonder if you could type it in the chat, or is there some way they can find it? I, or is it on a page somewhere? Or? Um, I don't actually have a full title of my study yet because I'm one year in, <laughs> um, but I can share the front title. Oh, I have to, I can share my. Thanks. Stephanie Schmidt, you probably have a page or your, uh, somebody's lab somewhere at U of I probably has you so show up somewhere. Yes, I have a LinkedIn too. <laughs> All right, we do have one question that came in. Is there preventative methods against catfish getting in from the river? Um, I haven't actually heard anything about catfish. I think the main concern right now has been carp. Um, typically though, um, when they rewater or do the rewatering and allow water back in to Emiquan, it's not actually pulled back in from the river. So that's one of their carp controls that they do. So it all comes back from snow melt and from rain um, after the drawdown. But this year, I believe, because it was such an intense drawdown, they are going to be pulling in water from the river. And there is that concern about carp coming in. Oh, OK. Oh, boy, another one. When do the young birds fledge? Is that long after the water levels are drawn down? Yeah, so when can um, the young fend for themselves or whatever to say? Yeah, um, so for the common gallinules and the American coots, they will leave the nest um, it, within about 48 hours. And we do not have eyes on them after that. They move far too quickly and they're too small for us to tag. Um, so we don't actually know much about their life history after leaving the nest. But for the least bitterns, we did happen to get some tags in them this year and track them. Um, and they will leave the nest reliably at about 15 days. So they're considered semi-precocial, so they can get up and walk out of the nest at about three days old and come back in, um, but they will reliably leave at about 15 days. And what we had found was the, uh, from preliminary data was that these water drawdowns are really changing their habitat use because the water was pulled off so much off of the landscape that we didn't actually have any cattail underwater by the end of the year. And these young birds needed to find usable habitat that still provided protection and access to food resources. And what we had seen was that they were shifting to using um, lotus leaf and living under lotus plants. Um, so we're curious to see if that will happen again this year. But yeah, it's definitely affecting it. Okay, um, I, let's have time for, I got a couple more questions, but I think we better stop after that. Um, 
Can you just re-explain very briefly how you determined that the cameras were safe? Um, yeah, so it was, it's just a simple statistical test. It's called logistic regression. Mm -hmm. And on the y-axis, you just have um, a one or a zero, meaning survives or fails. Um, and then you test whether having the camera present caused a survival or a failure. And essentially, it didn't have any correlation. It was kind of random whether they failed or survived. So that's what told us that the cameras didn't have any effect. If it was like all nets with cameras failed, then we would be pretty concerned. Okay. And then the last question I wanna ask here is another one that came in. Um, it's about the drawdowns. Why are they doing these big drawdowns again? Um, so they don't do the same drawdown every single year mm -hmm. uh, because if you do the same drawdown, you're essentially um, managing for the same species over and over again. So what they're doing is they're trying to make it as diverse as possible and create um, as dynamic of a natural wetland as you can with it being so manipulated. So they do cycles of drawdowns where they do a very intense one followed by almost no drawdown and then maybe a moderate one that'll pull around two and a half feet of water off the landscape. So it keeps it as a wetland, but it manages for as many species as possible. Okay, okay. Um... All right, well, other questions are coming in here. It looks like they're coming. If you wanna send questions to everyone and Stephanie happens to stay on the call and wants to respond to them, I think that might be a way we could try to handle some of these questions. Um, let's just thank Stephanie for all her efforts here. <laughs> uh, again, if, if you have questions and you wanna send them to everyone, maybe Stephanie can answer them or maybe someone in the audience might be able to have some insights while we're, while Sachi's uh, getting geared up here for her talk. Um, and I better introduce her. So, um, okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, thank you. Okay, Sachi, Sachi Koshat up in Ontario and other places in Canada, right? And even the US sometimes I heard. Yes, um, this presentation has actually been a fairly long time in the making as far as us being interested in having Sachi speak to us. Um, we planned on flying her in here at some point, but it didn't happen. Um, in 2019 sometime, um, one of our board members, Donna Kubik, visited Pelee Island uh, Bird Observatory and her enthusiasm showed so few bounds that um, <laughs> We encouraged her to get in touch with the um, banding station that Sachi's gonna explain more about and find someone there who could present to us. And it looks like they came up with one of their finer folks, Sachiko Schott, um, where she was an assistant bander. I think she go, comes, goes back there often uh, among other places um, to, to monitor bird populations in various ways. And she's going to talk about all things that happen at Peebo. She's probably going to tell us where it is because I'm not going to, to say yet. Um, um, and she's been doing this sort of thing since about 2008 when she discovered birders as a maybe a focus for her natural love of nature. Um, and since then, she's been working on bird research in Canada and the US. Um, and I heard last fall she was in Alberta somewhere. So she's definitely um, been having a, a great life, it sounds like to me, researching birds all over the place. So I'm gonna let her tell her story and let her take the stage here. So Sachi, welcome. And um, the floor is yours, so. That's great, thank you. Thanks to you for the introduction. That was great. Um, and yes, thank you to Donna as well, who really, um, was the motivating force behind this presentation and me being here to talk to you all tonight. Um, so as Steve said, um, my name is Sachi Schott and I'm a freelance field ornithologist. So basically I work for different organizations, again, in United States and in Canada, uh, doing field work for research projects that involve birds. And a large part of that has involved banding birds as part of the Pelee Island Bird Observatory. Um, which I have returned to many times over the past years. Uh, so this evening, I'm going to be talking to you about the ins and outs of bird banding and migration monitoring, uh, using the Pelee Island Bird Observatory as a kind of an example and a case study. 
Um, so I'll describe a typical day of work at the Pili Island Bird Wizard Observatory, which we call PIBO, um, and then go into the kinds of information that we can gain by banding birds using some of PIBO's band recoveries and band encounters as examples. So as Steve said, if you have any questions, just enter them into the chat box. Um, and then after the presentation, I'll answer as many of them as I can. Uh, so while PIBO does some monitoring work that involves breeding birds on Pili Island, which I will explain where that is <laughs> in a moment. Um, but for PIBO, the real cornerstone of their research is the migration monitoring program um, of which the bird banding is a part. So the first question that I want to answer tonight is uh, why migration monitoring? Why is it so important to monitor birds while they are on migration as opposed to at other times of the year? And basically it's because migration monitoring and migration provides us with an opportunity to get population counts of birds that breed and winter in remote areas that are farther to the north and to the south of us. A lot of the birds that PIBO bans are neotropical migrants, so birds that breed um, often in the boreal forest and then spend the winter farther down south in Central or South America. Um, a lot of other ones are short or long distance migrants, which spend the winter in Mexico or maybe in the Southern United States. Um, and to travel a shorter distance north each spring to their breeding grounds. Um, so the birds that you see in the photos here, Scarlet Tanager, a couple of warblers, Sharp Shintok, these are all migrants and they're some of the migrants that PIBO sees each year on the island. So a lot of these birds, as I mentioned, breed in the boreal forest, um, which is the name for a band of coniferous forest that stretches across the northern Canada and up into Alaska that you see on the map here. And the boreal forest is often referred to as North America's songbird nursery because it is so important as a breeding ground for the many different species of birds and of for neotropical migrants in particular. But it is quite remote, which makes it difficult to access for us to research the birds up there. So to demonstrate, this is a map of the population density uh, for North America. And the darker the color is, the more people there are living in that area. And if you remember where the boreal forest was on that map, it's up north in Canada in Alaska here. And you can see there's really, there's not a lot of people up there. There's not a lot of infrastructure, fewer roads, fewer towns. Um, and I couldn't quite find the map that I wanted, but if you look at um, eBird, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, birders submit lists to eBird and that way we get an idea of um, distribution of different species. But if you look at where those, those lists are being submitted to, or sorry, where those lists are being submitted from, that corresponds with the population density basically. So where there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people submitting these lists to eBird and to other research projects. So those areas are very well studied, but we have areas like the boreal forest, uh, Northern Canada all the way up here. There aren't a lot of people, not a lot of research going on. Um, so that's an under, research area that we really want to focus on. Um, and in addition, when birds are breeding, they're very spread out. Uh, each bird has its own territory. And of course, if they're not actively singing to try and attract a mate, then they're very secretive to try and protect their nests. So it can, it takes a lot of effort to find birds while they're on their breeding ground. And it's a similar story down south in South America where many of these species overwinter. So the human population you can see is really concentrated along the coasts here. There's a lot of very dense rainforest in the interior and many wintering birds also hold territories, which again makes them very spread out over a large area. Um, so when we want to answer questions like how many birds are there of each species? How many young are they raising successfully? Um, are their populations healthy? then the breeding grounds and the wintering grounds are not the most efficient place to go about finding answers to those questions. So if you think about it, counting birds in on the breeding grounds or on the wintering grounds is kind of like um, going door to door, asking census questions in an area like in a very rural area or in a suburban area where the houses are very far apart. So you have to cover a lot of ground. Um, it's very time consuming and also there's no guarantee that anyone is going to answer the door uh, when you knock. So instead of doing that, what we can do instead is monitor these birds while they are on their migration. So 
twice a year, these birds are migrating. They migrate north up to the breeding grounds in the spring and then follow the same path back down south in the fall. And as they fly, they're following certain what we call migratory flyways, um, which are paths that funnel them through places like Peely Island, where we cap can capture and count them more efficiently. So instead of going door to door with our surveys and our census questions in the big spread out suburban neighborhoods of the boreal forest or the South American rainforest, um, where you know people are at home, they're spending time with their families, they maybe don't want to answer our questions. Um, instead, what we do when we monitor birds on migration is like we are standing in a railway station or a subway station. Um, there's lots of people concentrated in these areas going by and we can stop some of them and ask them questions about where they're going, where they come from, and how long it will take to, for them to get home. Um, so we really, by taking those notes day after day and year after year, we can build up a really good picture of the health of these birds and these populations that we're interested in. So really, when we monitor birds on their migration, we do it in order to gauge the overall health of their population. So Peely Island itself is located at the junction of two of those migratory flyways, the Atlantic and Mississippi Flyway. And it's located in the western basin of Lake Erie. And it's also the southernmost inhabited point in Canada. So you can see this is Peely Island right down there. We've got Ontario to the north and then Ohio just to the south of us. And Peely Island is the largest island in the Lake Erie archipelago. Um, so when raptors and songbirds fly across Lake Erie on migration, they use these islands as stepping stones that provide safe places for them to stop um, if they need to. So you can see on the map here that Peely Island lies to the south and just to the west of what is Point Peely up here. And of course, Point Peely is very well known as a really great place for bird watching uh, during the spring and fall migration. And during fall migration in particular, if you're on the point uh, watching birds take off across the lake, a lot of them you can see are heading directly for Peely Island as the closest landfall. So Peely Island is a very important stopover site for migrating birds um, if they decide to fly across Lake Erie instead of flying around it. And human life on Peely Island revolves around uh, mostly tourism and agriculture. So most of the land is used for growing soybeans um, or grapes for the Peely Island winery. Uh, but there are also many natural areas that are managed and protected by a variety of different conservation groups. And two of the largest are Lighthouse uh, Point Provincial Park at, up at the north end of the island. Um, and then there's also Fish Point Provincial Park down at the south. And both of these are very important areas for migrating birds because for one thing, they're very large conservation areas. And they're also the first or last place for birds to land or take off from as they're traveling north or south. And Peebo is located within Fish Point Provincial Park on the south end of the island. And Peebo has been banding birds there since 2003. And on average, this station captures almost 3,000 birds per year. And we record an average of 194 species each year. Um, in total, I think the Bird Observatory has recorded over 300 species. So a lot of rarities that'll show up only occasionally, but on average, we can count on getting over 190 species each year. And for us, well, for all banding stations, the busiest season is definitely the fall because that's when you get all of the young birds that were hatched that summer. Uh, they've grown up and left the nest and now they're on their first migration down south. Um, as well, the fall migration season is a lot longer than the spring, just because in the spring, there's more competition for birds to return to the breeding, breeding grounds very quickly so they can establish their territories and start families. Um, and so the fall migration season is more spread out. We have more time to catch all of those new young birds on their very first migration. And the main focus of Peebo's fieldwork is on monitoring migrating birds. 
So I mentioned we do do some work with breeding birds, but for the most part, what we're really interested in is the migration monitoring. And we do that through a combination of bird banding and standardized visual observations, which helps us to create a daily snapshot of bird activity um, on and around fish point each day during the spring and fall migration. And moder migration monitoring programs at bird banding stations like Peebles generally have three components. There's the daily census, there's the bird banding, and then there are visual observations that we make um, in the netting area when we're down there each morning. And at the end of the day, we take the totals from all of those observation methods and combine them to come up with a daily total for each bird species. So this is a photo of our banding station down at Fish Point, which was built by some very generous supporters of Peebo. And basically just to keep us protected from the rain and the mosquitoes while we're down there each morning. And when the banding station is open, we'll work seven days a week, um, starting at the beginning of April, continuing to the end of June for the spring season, and then starting up again at the beginning of August and continuing to mid-November in the fall. And each morning, we try to do six hours of bird banding, although that's weather dependent. So if it's raining or if it's too cold, then we won't band birds. Um, but every day we definitely do an hour and a half long daily census. And we also make some visual observations while we're down at the banding station. So the most important part of all of this is definitely the daily census, uh, which is also the simplest. So it's just a 90 minute walk that we take each day beginning one hour after sunrise. And on that walk, we write down every bird that is seen or heard. And it follows the same path every time. And for Peebo, it's this path marked in red here, which makes a loop down and along fish point. So the census is the most important because it is so standardized. It takes place at the same time relative to sunrise. It follows the same path and it always takes 90 minutes. And that makes it really easy to compare the census results from day to day and year to year. But, Bird banding is more weather dependent, as I mentioned, uh, but in general, it will start half an hour, ah, so half an hour before sunrise and continue for six hours. Um, birds are most active in the morning um, when they come down to feed after migrating all night. And on most days by about noon, it's very quiet in and around the banding station. So at that point, we can close up and go home for the day and usually take a nap. Um, but Half an hour before sunrise, we head down to the banding station and open up the mist nets that we use to catch birds. And mist nets are made of a very fine nylon mesh that's very difficult to see for both birds and for people. And each net is, um, when we leave the station at the end of the day, we use a special technique to close the nets up and then furl them so that no birds can be caught while we're not there. Um, but when these nets are open and they're ready to catch birds, they are about two meters high and nine meters long. And you can maybe kind of see the mist net in the photo here um, that my coworker here is standing in front of. But in case you can't, I also have this handy illustration uh, to show you that mist nets, they're made of a very fine mesh and they are form four panels. And the mesh within each of those panels hangs kind of loosely, uh, creating a pocket at the bottom of the panel. So when a bird is flying through the woods, it flies into the net, hits the, the uh, mist net, falls into the pocket in the panel, and that will hold it until the bird can be extracted. And when birds are in the mist net, they generally look a little bit like this. They'll just they can't fly out of the net, so they'll just hang out and wait to be extracted, basically. And when the nets are open, we'll walk around and check them at least once every half an hour. When we find a bird, we'll extract it from the mist net. Uh, we put each bird in its own cotton bag, and we use that bag to carry it back to the banding station. And always the safety of the birds comes first. So if it is too cold or if it is raining or if it is too windy, we won't open the nets um, and we'll just do visual observations for the day. 
um, will also close nets if there are predators in the area because of course a bird that is hanging out in a mist net like this is very vulnerable it can't defend itself so if we notice that there are raccoons in the area um, or sometimes we see some fox snakes um, as was mentioned in our marsh bird presentation another big predator of birds um, but in that case we'll close the nets and we won't open them for the day and banding stations use mist nets because they are a passive method of capturing birds. Um, for migration monitoring, we won't put out any bait and we won't use any calls to attract birds into the nets because that would bias our results. With these mist nets, we just open them, wait to see what flies in, and that way the results are fairly unbiased. It gives, will give us a good idea of what birds are actually in the area. Uh, so let's say we've opened our mist nets, we've captured some birds, we've brought them back to the banding station. What do we do next? Um, the very first thing that we have to do for every bird is identify it. We cannot band a bird if we don't know what that bird is, uh, because if we do that, if we don't know what the bird is, then the scientific value of that information is nil. That can't tell you anything about populations. It can't tell you anything about timing of migration. You might as well just throw that band away. So if we can't identify a bird, which sometimes happens, um, usually it's with the Impidinax flycatchers, so willow, alder, Acadian flycatchers, which all look pretty much the same and have a lot of overlap, um, then we'll release those birds unbanded. But in the case of an ice bird, like the common grackle here, um, pretty easy to tell what that bird is. The first, the next thing that we do is we put a band on it. And you can see the band in the picture here. They are just a thin band of aluminum or sometimes of steel. Um, and that's stamped with a unique nine digit number. And those bands are shaped into a ring that we can fasten around the bird's leg using the special pair of pliers that you see in the photo there. So the pliers open that ring up, we can slip it around the bird's leg, and then we use the pliers to close it. You can see they've got the kind of a hole in the pliers so we don't squish the band or the bird. Um, we close the band so it can't fall off. And that's what's happening in that photo there. And bird bands come in a variety of different sizes. So we can pick a band that will neither pinch the bird's leg and it won't be so loose that it will slip off over the bird's foot or over the bird's ankle uh, up there. And because songbirds and raptors, uh, once they've left the nest, they are fully grown. Those birds will not grow anymore throughout their lifetime. So once we band a bird, we know that bird will never outgrow that band. And bird banding is a valuable research tool because it's a way of marking individual birds. Uh, thanks to that nine digit number, uh, banding a bird is like giving it a social security number or a social insurance number that you can look up to identify that bird and learn about uh, where and when it was banded. But we don't just put bands on the birds. While we have them in the hand, uh, we also take a few measurements before we let them go. So one of the things we'll do is that we'll blow on the bird's feathers, push those feathers back. And when we do that, what we're looking for is how much fat the bird has, which is important to know because bat birds use fat as fuel on migration. And birds have very thin skin. So you can actually, when you push the feathers up, you can look straight through the skin and see the fat, which is a yellowish color versus muscle, which is reddish. And then we use a scale from zero, meaning no fat, to seven, which means the bird is a butterball that's just covered in yellow fat. It's mm. all set to go on migration. Um, we'll mark that down and that lets us know sort of if that bird is in really good health, it's really prepared to go on migration or if it'll maybe stay on the island for a few days to feed up before it continues on its way. And we also measure wing length while well, we have the bird. So that's from what's technically the bird's wrist down to the length of the very longest flight feather. And that can be important for species that are what's called sexually dimorphic. So species where the male is a different size or color from the female. And in those species, you can often use wing length to tell if a bird is male or female. So for example, for the common grackles, like in this photo here, those are sexually dimorphic birds. Um, you can use 
plumage to tell the sexes apart. And you can also use wing length because males tend to be larger than the females. Um, for raptors um, and birds of prey, it tends to be the other way around. So for birds like sharp-shinned hawks and northern saw-wet owls, which we banned in the fall, the females are larger than the male. But again, we can use the wing length to tell the sexes apart. And while we have that bird in our hand, we also try to determine its age. And we do that by looking for differences in the color, the shape, and the wear of that bird's feathers. And those differences that we look for within, usually within the bird's wing, like what's happening in the picture here, uh, those differences exist because birds replace their feathers on a predictable pattern. Usually once a year, they'll replace all of their feathers. And so by looking and seeing if the bird has old feathers or new feathers, we can tell if it's a young or an old bird. Now, the aging is not terribly precise. We can't tell to the year how old a bird is, but we can tell if it's a bird that is less than a year old or if it's a bird that's more than a year old. So is it a bird that was hatched just the past summer or is it a bird that's older than that? And even though that's not terribly precise, uh, it can still provide valuable information um, because it can tell us about things like survivorship. And so how many young birds are surviving those long migratory trips as opposed to older birds. And it can also sometimes tell you things about habitat quality. So high quality breeding habitats tend to have more older birds on them because those birds are more experienced. And low quality breeding habitats often have younger birds on them because those birds just don't have as much experience when it comes to selecting um, territories or because they don't know where the high quality territories are. Um, so to look at aging a little bit more, um, here's some close-ups of a couple of bird wings. And the differences that we're looking for, um, what we're mostly looking for are the low quality feathers that young birds grow when they first leave the nest. So young birds, when they fledge, they have to grow a lot of feathers all at once. And so those feathers tend to be lower quality compared to the feathers that are grown by older birds who replace their feathers sort of one by one over a much longer period of time. Um, so if you look at the picture down on the left here, this is a myrtle warbler or a yellow rumped warbler. And you can maybe see these feathers look rather raggedy, they're sort of brown, they contrast with the darker, fresher feathers up here. So because the bird has these low quality brown worn feathers, we can tell that this is a young bird. So this is a bird that was just hatched the past summer. Uh, versus the black throated blue warbler up here. All of his feathers are really nice and dark very uniform, so we know this is an older bird who is more than a year old. So again, not terribly precise, but we can get a general idea of young versus old. Uh, we'll also try to sex birds before we release them. So knowing how many males versus females there are in a population is important for knowing if that population is sustainable. Are there enough adults of each sex around for that population to maintain itself? Uh, there are also sex specific patterns in migration um, that we look for. So sometimes males will migrate earlier or later than the females um, and or they might leave for the wintering grounds at different times as well. And figuring out if a bird is a male or a female, can, that can be very simple um, as you can probably guess, uh, or it can be incredibly difficult and impossible. So for example, we have this morning warbler up here um, he is in his nice spring plumage, has a lovely dark necklace, so we know that that's a male bird. But then in the fall, a lot of the males will lose that nice bleed breeding plumage. They'll start to look more like the females. Um, the young birds will also not have that really nice, brightly colored plumage. That's when you get your confusing fall warblers in the fall. And so, for example, this black-throated green warbler down here, uh, doesn't have the really dark throat that you would expect in a breeding male, but we can't know for sure um, without looking for some other characteristics. We can't know for sure if that is a young male 
or is it a female? Uh, we might have to sex that one as unknown. And of course there are birds like brown creepers and winter wrens where the males and the females look exactly the same all year round. Um, so those birds just pretty much automatically get sexed as unknowns unless it's in the breeding season when they, the females will sometimes develop brood patches um, if they are the sex that incubates eggs and the males sometimes have cloacal protuberances. So sometimes we can use those, but every now and again, we get birds that just get sexed as unknown. And the last thing that we do before we release the bird is we weigh it. Um, so unfortunately, don't have a photo of that, but it involves sticking the bird upside down in a tube to hold it in place on the weigh scale. Um, and then once we've taken the weight, we'll release the bird. So at PIVO, that involves sending it out through a trap door in the banding station, uh, which is what this Canada warbler is just flying out of there. So another really great photo by uh, one of our volunteers, Hannah. Um, so we've taken all of those measurements, we banded the bird, um, we write down all of that all of those measurements that we've taken. We especially write down the bird's band number and we were very careful to get that down correctly. Um, we write that down by hand on special data sheets and then all of that information gets entered into the computer later um, after we finish work for the day. And all of that data is made available to researchers in part through the Nature Counts website. Um, we also share it with organizations like the Canadian Migration Monitoring Network and Birds Canada. Uh, who use that data to come up with things like long-term population trends um, and other information that can tell researchers and policymakers more about which bird species need to be protected and how. And it's important for us to collect data using all three of those observation methods. So the census, the bird banding, and the visual observations because each of those methods works best for observing different types of birds. So for example, the daily census, um, you saw the path that we follow goes down along Fish Point. So it's a really good opportunity for us to count birds like gulls and shorebirds um, that we don't really see in the forest where the banding station is. Uh, bird banding is great because it's a way of um, accurately counting birds that are more secretive that we might not get accurate visual counts on. So for example, when we're down at the banding station for uh, six hours in the morning, uh, sometimes we might see two oven birds, for example, but we could band uh, up to 20 in a morning. So you can see we're really not seeing those birds, but they are around and we capture them in the mist nets. And that's the only way that we really know that there are that many oven birds there. Um, but we still need those visual observations so that we can, we can count um, high flying birds, for example, like tree swallows, which don't fly low enough to be captured in the nets, but which we will see flying overhead. Uh, so while there's often some overlap between each of those three different methods of observation, um, the daily census, the bird banding, and the visual observations, each of them has its own strengths and weaknesses. So it's only by combining all three of them that we can get really accurate daily totals at the end of the day. Um, but bird banding is really what I wanted to focus on tonight. And bird banding is interesting um, because it's a mark recapture study. So it involves marking birds with that bird band and that band allows us to identify that particular bird if it's recaptured later. And because we put all of that effort into writing down and entering all of the information that's related to where and when each bird was banded, recapturing banded birds can give, provide us with important information on things like how long birds can live, where they travel, and how and when they migrate. So there are two ways that banded birds can be uh, recaptured, basically. The first is called a band encounter, um, and that is when a bird is found alive. So it could be recaptured by another banding station, or it could, might be injured and be turned into a wildlife rehab center. Um, or sometimes nowadays, uh, photographers have cameras and camera lenses that are so amazing that sometimes they can actually get photographs uh, from which you can read the number on the bird band without ever actually capturing the bird. 
Um, and so those sightings can be reported as well. And the other way that bands get reported is through band recoveries. And those refer to occasions when the bird is found dead. So if it's a game bird or something like a duck or a goose, um, sometimes those bands could be found by hunters. Otherwise, if birds hit windows or they're killed by cats or they get hit by cars, sometimes people will notice that they have a band on them and they'll report those bands. And although it's very sad that the bird has died, um, we can still get uh, important information from that, including causes of mortality. So are a lot of these birds uh, hitting windows, for example? That's important to know for conservation as well. But the most basic information that we can get from a band encounter or a recovery is information about how old the bird is. So if we know the date when the bird was first banded and then the date when it was encountered later, that gives us a minimum for how long the bird has been alive for. So for example, this Cooper's hawk was first banded by Peebo on September 23rd, 2013. And Cooper's hawks can be aged using things like eye color. So young birds have yellow eyes, older birds have red eyes. Um, they can also be aged by plumage. So young birds are brown and have uh, vertical stripes on the breast as opposed to older birds, which are more of a slate gray on the back and then have horizontal stripes on the breast. So taking eye color, plumage, and things like molt limit into considerations, when Peebo first captured this Cooper's hawk, it was aged as a as being one year old in 2013. So we knew that this bird had been hatched in 2012. Uh, later on, we recaptured this same bird on September 27th, 2016. And when we recaptured it, we wrote down the band number and we took all of those same measurements that I described to you earlier. And when we looked the band number up, we, it told us the date when the bird was originally banded. And so from that, we knew that this male Cooper's hawk um, was four years old in 2016, uh, which is not terribly old, but considering that the average age for this species is just 16 months, that's still pretty great. We were very happy for this Cooper's hawk. And if you're interested in learning more about how long birds can live for, longevity records for various bird species are available on the Bird Banding Laboratory's website. Uh, so if you just Google longevity records, bird banding, that'll be one of the first results that you can come up, that come up and you can look at all kinds of different species and what's the longest that we know one of those birds has lived for basically. Um, and as well as telling you about the longest lived individuals for each species, it'll also give you some information about where they were first banded and where and how they were found later on. Uh, which can be interesting to see. So for Cooper's hawks, the longevity record is 20 years and four months, and that's a bird that was first banded in California in 1986, and it was later found in Washington state in 2006. So much longer than our Cooper's hawk that was just four years old, but who knows, maybe he'll be lucky and we'll catch him again in 10 years or so. And again, all of the information on this that's kept by the bird banding laboratory, of course, comes from bird bands. And so longevity is one thing that we can learn through banding birds. Something that's really exciting for us is when a bird that's been banded on Pelee Island turns up elsewhere. And a lot of these records come from banding stations in the United States. So when we band Northern Sawat owls, for example, uh, there's usually one or two that are later recaptured by bird banders on Kelly's Island, which is on the Ohio side of Lake Erie. But one of the largest distances that we know was traveled by a bird that was banded by Peebo uh, comes from a Veery, which we banded on September 3rd, 2016. And that bird was later recaptured by Costa Rica bird observatories on October 13th, 2016. Um, so that was very exciting for us. That was the first time that one of Peebo's birds had been encountered on a different continent. And so going by that information, 
um, we know that this bird traveled at least 3,400 all right. I was just wondering if you were in the boreal forest at the moment, but I, unfortunately, no. I'm in Toronto. You think the okay. internet connection would be perfect, but no. Don't yeah, know what's up tonight. There's always something getting in the way. I know how that goes in the city too. So it's, <laughs> nowhere is ideal. So I guess not. No. All right. Well, let's 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 press forward here. This is quite great. So let's. Um, I do have, we have a couple of questions since we get. If you want to. Somebody oh, yeah, asked, sure. how, how long does it take to process a bird, so to speak, when you get them on average? Uh, on average, if we really, <laughs> if we've really got a lot of birds and we have to get those birds out as fast as possible, it can take less than a minute to band a, and release a bird and do all those measurements. Wow. Um, so ideally, we'd like to take a little bit more time than that, but yeah, definitely that's... less than five minutes, usually about a minute or two minutes that we that we do. Okay, a um, couple other questions. Um, what is the search to do to find those banding record charts, the age charts? Uh, yes, um, unfortunately the uh, website address is... Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> not an easy one to repeat, um, but let me, I can share that um, slide again. But basically it's the uh, bird banding laboratory. So that's you guys down in the States. That's the organization that hands out bird bands and keeps track of all the records and things. Um, it's part of the United States Geological Survey. Um, so down at the bottom here, I have the, the website where I got these records from. Um, and I'll, I can send that to you again afterwards, but I don't want to try reading it out right now. Okay. Oh, I'll put it in the chat box, actually. Now that I think of it. Okay, well, I don't know if I typed it accurately, but I was close. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, okay, well, that should give us enough clues to be able to find that in the future. And if, um, if people want to, they can hit print screen on their computer at this point, and they'll get an image that'll actually have that uh, address, and they can print mm -hmm. it off later. That's another way to as well. Okay, and we were talking recaptures and records, right? So yes. How, so, many, how many come through PIBO more than once? Somebody asked that as well. How, how many recaptures do you get that aren't like same day recaptures or, you know? Right, um, I'm gonna go into that a little bit later. Oh, right, um, let's but, <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> generally speaking, <laughs> spoiler alert, but it is very, very few. That's what I thought. But yes, we'll get a little bit more precise about that um, later on in the presentation, if you don't mind waiting. Okay, no, please, please go, go ahead. Okay, um, so I believe I was telling you about this Viri. Yes. Okay, let's go back then. Oops. So, as I said, this was the very first time that um, a bird that was banded by PIBO was actually uh, recaptured on a different continent, um, as opposed to United States is where we get most of our uh, recapture records from. But this theory, it took a month and 10 days to travel from Pelee Island all the way down to Costa Rica when it was on its oops, fall migration. And so um, songbirds like Viri's, they generally migrate at night because they're trying to avoid predators like uh, hawks and falcons, which need, they rely on thermals to fly more. And for thermals, of course, you need the sun to heat up the ground and the air. Um, so hawks and falcons generally fly, they're more active and they migrate during the day. So in order to avoid them, songbirds like veeries migrate at night. So in general, um, a bird like this one would fly as far as it could in one night then come down to feed and rest around daybreak and be ready to resume its migration again at dusk. And Viri's breed in Canada and the northern United States and they winter down in Brazil. So this bird was probably already on its migration when it stopped over on Pelee Island and was captured and banded. And then Costa Rica would have been another a stopover site for it down here. And stopover sites are very important for migrating birds because they're like gas stations basically where migrants stop and refuel. 
So I mentioned that fat is fuel for birds, well, for all of us really. And really stop oversights are where birds pause, they pack on, they eat as much as they can, pack on as much fat, and then they can continue on their migration and fly as far as they can. Uh, now bird banding does have some limitations. And one of those is the fact that there's no way for the bird band itself to store or record information. So remember the band is just this little strip of aluminum or steel. Um, there's no little computer chip in there. Um, there's nothing that is recording information or transmitting anything in real time. And banding stations um, will process and handle many thousands of birds each uh, year. Um, so I mentioned PIBO bands on average 3,000 birds a year. That's where a smaller volume station, there are others that handle 10,000 birds a year. And so for that, bird banding is great because bird bands are very cheap, they're very inexpensive. Again, it takes us less than a minute to fasten one onto a bird and send it on its way. But if we want a more, more information, more detail on birds and where they're going, then we need to use other equipment. And one of the things that researchers are using more and more now as the technology gets cheaper and smaller are geolocators. And that's a small piece of equipment that the bird wears like a little backpack, basically. And geolocators measure light levels, which tells you what the sunrise and the sunset time is um, that that bird is experiencing each day. And then from that, researchers can go back and figure out where, what the longitude and latitude of that bird was basically um, for each day while it was wearing that geolocator. So there was a study done by the Delaware State University um, that attached geolocators to veeries to track them while they were on their migration. And so I'm gonna use some information from that study and then we'll fill in the blanks on our veeries migratory journey as it traveled south um, that fall. So when we captured that veery, it was aged as a hatch year bird. So a young bird, one that was born in 2016, uh, somewhere in the red part of the map here. So born in a deciduous forest somewhere in North America. And on September 3rd, 2016, it was captured and banded by PIBO. And we took all of the measurements that I described and then we released it. And based on what we know, um, again, from that study about veery migration, it could have broken up its migration at stopover sites um, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, and possibly on the northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico as well. And it would have remained at each of those stopover sites for at least one day, maybe several days, um, if it needed to feed and gas up, or if the weather was bad. So when birds are migrating down south, um, what they prefer is um, a little bit of a north wind to kind of give them a bit of a push, a bit of a tailwind, or sometimes very light south winds are good because then those give the birds more lift. Um, but very strong winds or rain, those aren't good for flying in, so birds will often sit bad weather out for as long as they can. And the geolocator study found that veeries spend between six to 12 days at their stopover sites on their, while they are on their fall migration. So clearly it's not just the breeding and the wintering grounds that are important for migrants. It's also all of the ground that they fly over on their way to and from those sites. So for veeries, that's all of that area in yellow here, which is where they're sited um, when they're on migration. And then on uh, October 13th, 2016, one month and 10 days after it was banded, that very same veery was captured and that we captured and banded on Pili Island flew into a mist net in Costa Rica. Um, it was processed by the Costa Rica bird observatories. Um, so they read the band number, wrote it down and reported it to the North American Bird Banding Program and they passed the news on to PIBO. And in the meantime, still wearing that same bird band, the veery was released and continued migrating. And again, the geolocator study found that veeries usually stop and rest at stopover sites in Colombia and Venezuela as well before ultimately reaching their wintering grounds. And those wintering grounds are all the way down here, mostly in Brazil. And this is where the veery would have spent the winter of 2016 and 2017, 
feeding up on fruits and insects and building up the fat reserves that it would need for the spring uh, when it would begin migrating north once again. And since um, I mentioned before, there's a lot of competition for birds to be the first ones on the breeding ground. They can stake out a really good high quality breeding territory and they want to start raising their families as fast as possible. So spring migration is much shorter than the fall migration. And that geolocator study found that on average, uh, Viries will spend just 17 days migrating north uh, from their wintering grounds to their breeding grounds. So you can see that's a really big difference compared to that fall migration where it took the Viri um, over a month to travel from the breeding grounds to the wintering grounds. But by the time April or May of 2017 came around, that Viri would have been back on its breeding ground, ready to raise young of its own, um, assuming, of course, that it successfully navigated all of the many perils that lay in wait along its migration route. Uh, so that's just one of the voyages that would have been made by just one of the birds that Peebo banded. But all of the neotropical migrants that we capture and observe make trips like this every single year, traveling back and forth from one continent to another. And migration monitoring stations, bird banding stations, like Peebo and like the Costa Rica bird observatories, um, help to make the connection between those breeding grounds and those wintering grounds, no matter how far apart they are. Um, however, going back to that question about how many of these banded birds we ever see again, it's only a very, very small fraction of birds that are banded that are ever encountered or recovered. Most of them, they don't get recaptured by any other bird banding stations, and they're not found by someone who, you know, notices that a bird has hit the window or anything like that. Um, so they're not likely to be found and reported as a band recovery either. And so the exact numbers vary by species. But as a rule of thumb, uh, you have to band 10,000 birds in order to get one band encounter or band recovery. Uh, like the Cooper's Hawk or like the Viri that we just discussed. So for example, for a bird like the Myrtle Warbler in this photo here, that's a very common species in Eastern North America. Uh, bird banding stations band thousands and thousands of them every year. But for the Myrtle Warbler, if you band 10,000 Myrtle Warblers, then six of them will turn up again later on. Um, so with such low odds of recapturing birds, the real strength of bird banding isn't in the recapture part of the mark recapture study. What's really important is that we are just marking these birds. So for bird banding stations like PIBO, and in turn for organizations like I mentioned the Canadian Migration Monitoring Network and Birds Canada, uh, bird banding is most important as a tool for long-term population monitoring. So by capturing and banding birds each spring and fall and following that consistent, very standardized protocol, we're doing the same thing every day during the spring and fall migration. Uh, we can learn a lot about how many birds there are of each species, um, how many are males versus how many are females, how many young birds there are compared to old birds, and we can also compare those numbers over time. Um, so banding is an essential part of that because that way we know that we aren't double counting these birds. So again, like a social insurance number or a social security number, each bird can only have one band at a time. So that means there is one nine digit number that will identify that particular bird. And so if we capture a bird that doesn't have a band, then we know it hasn't been counted yet. If we capture a bird that does have a band, um, then we can look back through our records and see, is this a bird that we banded this same day? Is it a bird that we banded last week or last month? Or is it someone else's bird altogether? And then knowing that we can decide whether or not to count it um, in our daily totals. And that's as opposed to monitoring bird populations just by using visual observations. So if you do that, it's really hard to know if you've counted a bird already or not. So for example, say we're sitting at the banding station and we see a flock of 20 pine siskins fly overhead. We have to decide, is, are those the same pine siskins that as the flock of say 40 that flew by earlier, 
or are these completely new birds? Are there 40 pine siskins or are there 60 pine siskins? Um, we can't know for sure. Um, so we will still write down those observations and include them in the daily totals, um, but there's always an element of educated guesswork involved in knowing if we're actually getting the numbers right. Um, so again, bird banding, really great because that way we know we are not double counting any of these birds. We can get really accurate numbers that way. And Birds Canada is one of the organizations that does the really hard number crunching um, involved in turning all of the raw data that banding stations produce into something that is coherent and can be used um, by policymakers, for example. And they make some of their results available through the Nature Counts website, um, where researchers can also download entire data sets and use that in their own research and also check out the population indices and things like seasonal abundance charts that Birds Canada puts together. So to show you an example of some of the data um, that PIVO generates and that Birds Canada um, calculates, um, this graph down here shows the population index for the Magnolia Warbler on Pelee Island. So again, just using PIVO's data. And this just shows the spring data here, but basically the black dot shows how many magnolia warblers were captured in a given year. The blue line is the overall trend over time. And looking at that, you can see that the magnolia warbler has been declining by 9% each spring on Pelee Island. Although you can see that that encompasses various highs and lows with the black dots here. And that's why it's so important that stations like PIBO operate for as long as possible, because what's really valuable is that long-term population data. Um, if you're just monitoring bird populations for a year or two, you might capture the very high highs or a very low low, um, but you'll miss that overall trend, which is what's really important. So a single bad year, like say 2015 down here, where it was a comparatively low number of magnolia warblers that we observed, um, a single bad year like that won't drive a very common species like the magnolia warbler extinct. But by the same token, a really good year like 2003, where there were, again, a comparatively high number of magnolia warblers, that alone won't tell you that this species is safe and doesn't need uh, conservation methods, or doesn't need to be protected, basically. Um, and the decline of 9% that we see here is pretty typical um, for a wood warbler, which is what the magnolia warbler is. Um, so in 2019, the North American Bird Conservation Initiative published a report on the state of Canada's birds. And that showed that for forest birds, again, like the magnolia warbler, um, forest birds that winter in um, South America, they have declined by 39% since 1970 um, due to a lot of factors like climate change and habitat loss. Um, and again, I wanna stress the importance of long-term monitoring of these bird populations. So by itself, an annual decline of 9% maybe doesn't look like anything to worry about, but again, over the long-term, you end up with a decline of 39%. That tells us that we really need to be working um, on conserving habitat for these birds and helping them out as much as we can. Um, and Birds Canada also calculates seasonal abundance graphs for different species. Um, so that just shows what the odds are that you will see um, a particular species um, in a given location at a given time of the year. So I have two graphs here um, to compare. And again, these graphs are plotted using PIVO data. And the top graph shows the seasonal abundance for the golden crowned kinglet, which is a very small songbird. Uh, it's an insect eater, but it's also very well adapted for cold weather. Um, so in some areas of North America, it's a year round resident. In other areas, they're a medium distance migrant that winters in the United States and then travels north into Canada to breed. Um, and they are one of the very first migrants to arrive um, on Pelee Island in the spring. So you can see when we start our migration monitoring on the 1st of April, the golden crown kinglets are already there. 
and they've left pretty much by the end of April, so very early in the spring season. And they're also one of the last migrants to arrive in the fall, again, beginning in September over here. And then there are still some of them that are present in November when we close up the banding station. Um, versus down here, we have the Canada warbler. And that's a long distance migrant that winters in South America and breeds in the boreal forest. So the Canada warbler is one of the last warblers to arrive on the breeding grounds in North America. And one of the first ones to leave after breeding. And you can see that Peebo really only begins to see them in May. Uh, down here, by which time the golden crown kinglets have already left and passed through Pelee Island and they're on their breeding grounds. And again in the fall, Canada warblers are already present when we restart our migration monitoring in August. And then they reach their peak and leave they're off the island by the time the golden crown kinglets show up later on um, and they reach their peak in October and November. So that shows you a little bit about how different adaptations and different migration strategies influence things like the timing of migration. And hopefully that shows you a little bit of what that will look like for birders like us. And that's another example of the kind of information that migration monitoring can provide. So in addition to information like about longevity, like we saw with the Cooper's hawk, and information about migration that we discussed along with the Viri. And I just wanted to end this presentation by encouraging all of you to keep an eye out for banded birds and to report them if you find them. So of course, capturing birds should only be done by professionals um, with the appropriate training, but I am sure you have all come across window strikes, for example, or have maybe seen roadkill birds by the side of the road. Um, and I want you to remember that even in death, Well, I think I could probably finish that sentence for <laughs> Oh, so close. <laughs> as someone who's done bird rescue downtown for the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors, as well as a little bit of banding, even in death, the birds can be quite valuable. The ones we find, I'll go to the Field Museum. And if they're banded, I'm sure they report those bands back, just like Sachi was going to say. So, um, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to type them in to the chat. I'm sure Sachi will come back for a final hello, goodbye. Um, <laughs> there she is, she's back already. <laughs> so I, I kind of took a stab at finishing your sentence about uh, birds and death. <laughs> <But> <laughs> To, um, Good, that was a grim note to end on. Yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid I didn't make it that much nicer, but I've done a little um, bird collision monitoring here and such. So we. Um, oh yeah. We do yeah, you're right. We all, I'm sure, almost everyone on this call has uh, encountered something like what you were describing. So, yes. Yes, definitely. So how do but we yeah. get, how do we get to visit Peebo? Was a question that came in. <laughs> so do you want to finish? We can see your your web your web address here for reporting banded birds and yes, that's right. So if when you do find dead birds, if it's possible, check and see if they've got a band on them. And if they do, you can uh, record the band number, encounter date, and the location where you found that bird, and report it online at reportband.gov. And then the bird banding laboratory will look up that band number. Um, they'll let the original bander know that their bird has been found again, and they will send you a certificate of appreciation, giving you all the information that they have about that bird, telling you where it was first banded um, and when it was banded, basically. So remember, very few banded birds are ever encountered or recovered ever again. Uh, so every little bit helps there. Um, but yes. Okay, well, yeah, thank, that, thank, you, thank you for uh, everybody for uh, attending tonight and for everybody's patience and so many great pieces of information here. It's really nice comprehensive look at bird banding as well as uh, some insights into PIVO. So I really enjoyed it, thank you.
Great. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you guys. There's a bird you don't get in your nets too often, probably. So no, definitely not. But it is my favorite, so I had to put a picture. Yeah, of it yeah I just wrote a book about them last year. Um, <laughs> so how do we visit Peebo? Was one of the questions that came in. Uh, yes. Well, when we're not in COVID times, yeah. um, Peely Island um, is accessed by ferry, um, so it doesn't run over the winter, but beginning earlier in, early in the spring and running until late in the fall. There's a ferry that runs um, either from uh, Leamington or Kingsville on the Ontario side, or there's also a ferry that runs from Sandusky in Ohio. Um, that's how you can get to Peely Island. Um, there are a lot of uh, B&Bs there um, to stay at. Um, unfortunately, Ferries tend to run late in the day, so for birding, it's not really a day trip that you can make exactly. I would recommend staying for a couple of days. Um, but once you're there, everyone's welcome to visit the Peely Island uh, observe, Bird Observatory. The banding station is down at Fish Point. Um, and really, probably the easiest way is to either contact Peebo in advance. So Peebo.ca will give you our contact information and get instructions on how to find the banding station because it is a little bit hidden in the woods as uh, Donna can tell you. Um, or if you stop at the Heritage Center on Peely Island, they also will be able to provide you with the directions to get down there. And again, uh, bird banding takes place in the morning. So uh, by about noon, generally, we've closed up the station for the day. So you wanna come as early as possible in the morning. Very good. There's a bird observatory on the island. Is that a good place? I think that's the one you were talking about, isn't it? Or is there another? Yeah, no, we're, we are the only bird observatory <laughs> oh, on Peely excellent. Island. All right, I'm sure there's plenty of birds all over the island to observe those, so. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, it's not quite as spectacular as Point Peely, but it is a very good place um, for bird watching on migration, especially if you're looking for a place that's a little bit more off the beaten track, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you count migrating hawks just like other birds. Is that correct? I mean, you're, you're yes. observation wise. Yeah, we, have we hawk do. Watch in DuPage County that's quite popular and um, been around for yeah. a while. Yeah, so we do um, count hawks as part of our migration monitoring, but really we don't see the huge numbers of it that like you would see at the Hawk Watch um, stations, for example, um, because again, hawks really use thermals um, when they're flying or migrating. And for that, they have to be over solid ground, basically. So they really tend to avoid flying directly over um, the lake. They'll mm -hmm. tend to go around it instead. So if you really want to do hawk watching, then yeah, you'd have to stay uh, on the mainland, basically. Mm -hmm. um, Charpshins hawks are maybe the only hawk that we banned on a regular basis. That, that would make sense, yeah. Um, do shorebirds stray into the nets sometimes too, or do they pretty much good at avoiding you? <laughs> yeah, they're mostly, the nets that we have are all kind of in the forest. Yeah. Um, so I think we've captured a solitary sandpiper once, but I think that was the only shorebird that we've ever caught. Um, so again, those are birds that we count on the daily census, but we probably won't see um, in, a, in the netting area. Yeah, I guess he wanted to be more solitary than the other sandpipers, okay. All right. Um, well, any other questions, but um, otherwise, I, I, I hope you have a great spring and a, you know, you end your time off too as well, enjoy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Are you, um, were you up and running last year with all the COVID stuff? I mean, with a small group like you had or? Yeah, so for Peebo, um, yeah, all the banding stations and bird observatories really had to make some executive decisions about how to handle COVID. So in Peebo's case, they decided not to open, not to run the bird banding last year. Um, but again, they kept up with the daily census and some visual observations and with a, a smaller team. So this past year I was, as you mentioned, I was in Alberta for the spring and, and fall migration. Oh, okay. 
instead. Yeah. I did have a couple more questions uh, pop in if you have another minute or two. Um, sure. One of our local banders here actually asked, um, does PIVO operate a MAPS breeding or banding station during the breeding season? Mm, um, no, we don't do the MAPS station. Um, although that was something that I did in Alberta this past year actually. Um, but for the breeding bird work, we concentrate on breeding bird censuses and also point counts as well. So we haven't, it's been under consideration like setting up a map station in there, but for now we're just concentrating on uh, visual observations. Okay. And I guess uh, one final question, do they still sell a lot of or process or a lot of vegetable seeds on Pelee Island? Not so much anymore. Yeah, these days it's almost entirely soybeans as far as agriculture goes and grapes, like I mentioned. So the Pelee Island winery is there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's a lot more of a monoculture than it used to be back in the day. Mm -hmm. A little bit like Illinois in that aspect, although we don't have quite the, the winery maybe, although we have some anyway. <laughs> All right, one more question, then I'll, then I'll wrap it up. Um, what about the resident birds and nesting birds? Do do they ever, well, I guess you wouldn't ban them in the summer, right? There's no banding going on during the main breeding season. Mm -hmm. But you are capturing residents sometimes either at the front or tail end of the breeding season or? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's always a few, like, I mean, there are some birds that stay on the island year round, of course. So there's um, a core group of Carolina wrens, for example, that will recapture year after year because they're they're always there singing their little hearts out at the banding station. Yeah. Um, and then definitely towards the end of the spring season, we start to see a lot of recaptures, um, especially of yellow warblers. So again, we know those are birds that have set up breeding territories somewhere nearby. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens is that we come to recognize those band numbers or we'll make a note of them and then we can just release those birds at the net so we don't have to take them back to the banding station each time and that way we're interrupting their breeding season as little yeah. as possible. I guess you're getting a close look at those birds comings and going so that's kind of cool in a way too so um all right well thank you for you know sticking with us for so long and um thank you the audience too and it's, it's been a great kickoff to the year I'd have to say so I'm really glad we finally got to meet you um, and enjoy your presentation. So have a great rest of the year. Great. And, um, yeah, look forward to hearing more what's going on up there. That's for sure. I think you've definitely made us aware of what's going on with <laughs> you. So thank you. Good. Yes, great. Thanks. It was a real pleasure to talk to you all tonight. Thank you, Sachi. <laughs> thank you. It was very Hi, interesting. <laughs>